Hi. I'm okay. Yeah, okay. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Hi, Sonia, how are you? Hi, good, how are you? Fantastic. I can see you've got your fantastic um, lipstick on there. Go, go, go. It's, it's my armour. Do you know, I talk about it so much that now when I do events, I literally get people in my messages beforehand being like, don't forget your lipstick. Like, what lipstick are you wearing now? It's crazy. I love that. I love it. Um, I, just, I just did a, I did a keynote at 12, so I've just like got up and got ready since then. Oh, okay, fantastic. Well, thank you for joining us. We're just uh, waiting for the other panelist members before we start. Yeah, it's good. Don't worry. Fantastic. I'll just send them a little ping now. Hello there. Hey, can you hear me? Hi, Louisa. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Yes, we can hear you. Chris? Oh, I think you're on mute, Chris. I just was saying hi. Hey, how are you? Hi. Well, fine, thank you. We're just waiting for our final um, panelist member before we start. Hi, Helen. Nice to have Hi. you both. Well, let's make a start. Um, thank you for all the panelists um, that have actually uh, come on. Um, so we're going to start today, um, obviously, um, discussing our episode three, which is uh, part of the innovation, digital diversity and inclusion in the wake of COVID-19 Game Changer. 2020 summit. So our episode two is STEM, Equitable Opportunities, and I'm your host this afternoon, Susan Flola, CEO, Creative Director of Jubix. Jubix is a SaaS-based platform that matches ideas to expertise and investment in a two-sided marketplace that gives you a fiscal evaluation of your overall network and also the people that are compatible in terms of collaboration. I would like to now hand it over to Helen to give her introduction of her company and who she is, and then we'll hear from our other panelists who they are. Helen? Hey, Susan, thank you very much for inviting me on today. Um, my name is Helen Disney. As you mentioned, I'm the CEO of a company called Unlocked, which is a bridge into understanding blockchain and emerging technologies. And throughout my career, I've worked in various male-dominated industries, including both the political world when I worked in public policy and recently in the last six years in the technology and blockchain and cryptocurrency world. So I'm interested in how we can increase diversity, mm -hmm. increase representation of women and other minorities in tech. Um, so very happy to be here. And I think COVID-19 has thrown all of this into kind of stark relief it's changing the way we get educated it's changing our job opportunities it's changing the way people are getting investments so a lot of things to talk about in this session fantastic thank you so much Helen. Mahalid, if you'd like to introduce yourself hello uh, my name is uh, Mahalid Rahman um, so uh, I am the head of finance and HR um, at a data handling analytics uh, and advanced algorithms and um, company dealing with cybersecurity, um, insurtech and insurance underwriting called Complex, as well as um, I have my own consultancy that helps startups uh, accounting HR support to help them scale. And I'm also involved with Jubix uh, in terms of fintech and re regulatory management. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Mahalid. And Sonia, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Sonia Barnett. I am an entrepreneur, TEDx speaker, and diversity advocate. I run a global community which enables um, people in technology, business, and entrepreneurship called NMF Network CIC, also known as Like Men Females. Alongside that, I do uh, numerous training and consultancy workshops for corporates on how they can be more inclusive, um, create diversity, especially when it comes to STEM and technology, work with universities and secondary schools to encourage more diverse characters into these subjects and share thought leadership through a variety of podcasts and articles again talking about how technology is so important how we can um, enter stem fields and why inclusion in technology is definitely the way forward um and, and in the future fantastic thank you very much for that sonia and chris if you'd like to give your brief introduction hi everyone i'm chris Dimming. i'm an applied anthropologist i'm originally from the uh, US, but I did my uh, PhD at Durham University in the UK. Uh, got the PhD in 2017. In terms of my focus, I'm really a sociocultural anthropologist in the sense that 
I'm interested both in, um, in cultural norms and how they're reproduced and shaped over time, as well as um, social structures and the way that these interact with cultural concepts. And as part of my career, I've recently been a uh, UX researcher and um, chief research officer with a startup called Javelin, a prop tech startup. So in terms of where sort of I'm looking at in the direction of STEM and inclusion, where I think it's really crucial is that as we're having these debates around the future of work and remote working, that we're really able to equip people for the new types of work environments. So I'm very happy to be here and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Chris. And last but not least, Louisa, do you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks for having me, Susan. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Louisa Pelizari. I'm an executive assistant, and I've been working with executives in uh, financial firms and consultancies in London since 2015. And in 2018, I joined Jubex as part of the advisory team um, due to my interest in researching blockchain technology. Um, yeah, very excited to be here. I'm very passionate about the topic. I've taken my own um, route and education in STEM. So, yeah, it's uh, very, very happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Lisa. So now we're going to move into our first um, overview of our topic, STEM Equitable Opportunities. And we're going to hand it over to Helen to give us a five-minute overview. Helen? Thank you so much. It's such a massive topic and it's um, both inputs and outputs. So it's, it's almost impossible to level the playing field in terms of where people start. You know, we're all born in different parts of the world. Uh, we're born different genders, different sexualities, different ethnicities, and it's impossible for us to really make things equal but it is possible for us to level up in terms of the opportunities that are offered and I think you know this as we we spoke about in our preparatory discussions it combines a lot of things it combines how people are exposed to ideas in the education system and potentially innovating a lot in the type of curriculum that we offer to children um, and to girls and boys to understand that you know gender is not this sort of fixed thing that they may be been taught by their families or taught by society and that actually we can go for any opportunity that we want regardless of our gender or background so you know that's the starting point we need to throw up the education system and I think remote learning is, is very interesting because it is starting to show up different divides it's starting to show up first of all that many people are not even online um, not just that they don't have access to computers but that maybe they have a phone or they have a, a laptop but they're not even on the internet so it's very hard for them to access a lot of the remote learning people have been doing since the pandemic hit so that's one huge divide of opportunity is people young people are not even able to access education and then we've got the workplace and that you know that brings up other challenges and then we've got once people move into entrepreneurial life we can see that many times those who are from ethnic backgrounds or women or other underrepresented groups find it harder to get access to capital when it comes to pitching particularly things like traditional VC funding or even in the crisis you know a lot of the funds that have been opened up to entrepreneurs are open only to people who've already got some kind of funding so you know how can we change that and I think one of the good parts of this is that people are open to new things because everything's changing in the outside world so there may be opportunities for people to just get on a Zoom call and speak to a funder that they may never have had a chance to have the opportunity to speak to if it was a traditional meeting and they might take six months to even network with that person in the physical world. Um, so it has both its good and bad sides, I think, but I think it's an opportunity for those who are agile and innovative um, and maybe a little bit different from the norm. I think, you know, traditional ideas are being kind of upended. So if you are someone who's able to approach things from a, an innovative perspective, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're just a, a kid in school, I think now's the time to bring that creativity to the fore and, and to be brave and just seize the moment and say, Look, now is the time to really try, try new things. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Helen. I mean, I just wanted to touch on your last point about, you know, children obviously having unique ideas and being quite in innovative. So obviously bringing that back into the, you know, curriculum is really needed at this point, especially now that we see, you know, uh, a lot of remote learning um, tools being utilised due to the pandemic. So yeah, definitely. Um, your last point is, um, you know, very much needed at this time. 
Yeah, I, mean, um, I just think about how things have changed, you know, with, with STEM or STEAM, you know, my daughter is, is eight and she does STEAM in school. So it's, it's bringing art in as well. So trying to bring that aspect of sort of two separate worlds, they're actually combined. You know, if we think about a blockchain technology company, it might have a great product, but is the user interface friendly? Does it appeal to all genders or is it designed by a 20 year old man who maybe hasn't thought about some aspects that would appeal to another group of people so these are all important factors it's not just about the tech or the science it's also about how we interact with things from a cultural point of view 100 percent. thank you so much for that and um, so we're going to move into our first question for this afternoon and the first question is in recent years there has been a surge in STEM activities and since the pandemic everyone is now communicating digitally will this cre create more opportunities for STEM participation I want to first point this question at Mahanad, um, and then obviously hear a response from Sonia as well. So Mahanad, if you'd like to start. Uh, yeah, um, I could talk about this from a, uh, a kind of a workplace uh, perspective. I mean, I mean traditionally, traditionally, STEM employees have been slightly behind the curve when it comes to uh, you know, greater diversity for um, you know, attracting women, black, um, Asian, minority, ethnic uh, candidates, and people with disabilities. But already, uh, I'm I'm sensing a change, especially with black, Asian, and minority, ethnic candidates. And um, for a lot of tech companies that I've been associated with, that um, those they tend to be um, better represented. But I should I should state that most of them tend to be men. Um, it's still there's a, there's a long long way to go in terms of trying to attract. Uh, female uh, candidates um, into more STEM or traditionally STEM uh, careers. So to do with things like engineering, um, development, um, architecture, all of that sort of stuff, it's um, still very, very male dominated at the moment. But also I think with this COVID thing, I think it could potentially open up opportunities um, which could uh, potentially liberate parts of the workforce. So I'm talking about maybe working mothers um, who uh, have greater flexibility to work from home. Um, also, if you're, um, um, if, if you're, for instance, if you're based outside a major city and uh, you're a quantitative analyst with an engineering uh, background, for instance, I mean, recently uh, we hired a quantitative analyst there in West Pembrokeshire in Wales um, and their job is all kind of, uh, online so they don't need to be in the office anymore I mean all of that has kind of changed so so being restricted to a particular location ie in around the southeast of London is no longer a requirement also there's uh, you know uh, employers are also providing uh, more kind of subsidies for, to help people set up a, a home office as well um, from, with that so so again for them it also means reduced office costs as well because office uh, costs tend to be quite high and then with the explosion of uh, cloud solutions like zoom slack onedrive box docusign and um, you don't need to have any uh, physical documents anymore you can be pretty much anywhere in the world and what this uh, whole covid thing has done is it's really accelerated this process where you could be absolutely anywhere and um, and uh, have access to uh, all of these or have the resources to do your job but also um, again there's um, uh, for, for those who are you know as if you're kind of innovative and agile um, there's Udemy, Coursera and um, a lot of employees as well now and um, are I mean especially in the, in, 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 the, in the tech company that I've been involved with they've been sponsoring a lot of employees to learn things like Python uh, a, a, re a relatively very uh, reasonable cost um, of sometimes just 20 pounds a month uh, again that would have not been possible previously so people are becoming more aware of all these training resources also uh, in terms of people with uh, disabilities uh, as well and um, perhaps um, the working from home culture may be better suited for them because they may have a, a space where they're already things are kind of already adaptable for them but there's also the, the downside of all this COVID stuff and people working from home um, as well as uh, just from the cyber side, you know, uh, you know, there's a lot of legal issues involved with that. Um, they could, employees need to be savvy in terms of uh, phishing attempts, all that kind of thing. Uh, they, need to be, they need to have the right training. Um, also, um, um, it's, 
uh, from a mental health point of view as well. Um, I, I've, I've seen employers really step up and help out uh, some of their employees uh, dealing with stress, dealing, providing them with resources, with apps to help them out. And um, so there's been some thing, positive things going in the right direction. As I said, say, there's still a, a massive skill, skill shortage in this area. And uh, uh, whenever uh, we tend to see a good candidate with the right skill set, we tend to try to hoover them up uh, very, very quickly. But uh, but I have to say, uh, women generally still are massively underrepresented in this area. Fantastic. Thank you, Mahani. That was a very rounded uh, response. Um, Sonia, would you like to respond to, uh, from your perspective, of course, uh, to what Mahana has said? Yeah, of course. So I, I love the fact that there's acknowledgement that there's a lack of representation, as well as real key points as to what we can do to start really um, diversifying the, the subject area and the, the industry. I think one of the things which um, is extremely important is that the motivation for these subjects comes from your first kind of socialization at schools. And so being in the school and being around uh, either thought leaders or teachers or academics, uh, or even kind of your friends who are into these uh, industries and know about them is initially what starts. So my fear with us being offline uh, from schools and, and kind of doing that virtually is there is a whole group of, of young people who are not around kind of uh, parents or, or carers who may not necessarily be in the STEM field or the subject and so it may be difficult for them. I know for, for myself I was the first in my family to go to university, I was the first um, like daughter to go into school and it was my school that taught me all the options I could be because my parents don't come from a uh, kind of a, a linear education or academic background. But the second kind of point to make is yes, you have technology, and I completely understand like adult more accessibility. But when you're talking about it from a young person perspective, which is a lot of the work I do, you're talking about families, especially in the UK, who have three, four, five kids, but one laptop. So not everyone has the accessibility to technology or the internet as they would have beforehand. Um, I have a younger cousin, she's 15, she is extremely smart and super driven, loves maths, loves computer science, already has it all figured out. And you know, she's really open, she's like, I've seen you, like, she's seen me go to university and do things in real, really male-dominated cultures, so she's like, if you can do it, I can do it. But that's, that's four sisters who share one laptop. <laughs> four sisters who have to do all of their homework, respond to teachers, and, and come over. So I guess my point being is that, because we are now moving into a, into a space where technology is key and we, do, we will be online and you know there's vast benefits of that including uh, mobility, including um, global uh, kind of information being shared, including connectivity and community building. We need to now make it, how are we making these devices, these software accessible so that families can have them, so that schools can give them out to kids who are really in need. Uh, take them home and use them during these times and also it's not just school kids it's even teachers like there's a lot of stress you know when you're in a, a classroom a teacher can speak to 30 kids and they all have general kind of similar or same questions so they put their hand up they can answer but right now teachers are getting 30 different emails from different kids and different parents being like oh, what do I do <coughs> Times classes the 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 last point I want to make is there is so much work already being done to encourage um, diversity in STEM and inclusive cultures in STEM, including the work that we're doing through like Men of Females, including all of the talks that we give or the workshops that doing, or even webinars like this, where we can have, uh, you know, groups of different characters and different backgrounds come together and talk about how great it is. So it's great that the awareness is there, the recognition is there. It's definitely not going, um, the, the rate of change is definitely not as fast as it can be. But I think a lot of that comes back down to how can we use this time wisely? How can we share the insight of the resources we have during kind of times where we might be furloughed, we might be transitioning between <coughs> maybe home? Can we give our time um, to sit on webinars? Can we talk to teachers to kind of zoom into schools and to share insight? Can we send books? Can we do like 50, you know, 50 second short video clips and send it to girls and boys across the nation to be like, this is what a scientist does this is what a computer a lecturer does and actually I did business and I'm now in STEM and you know I'm one of I'm I, I, I was a further maths and chem major when I was in school 
And then I remember when I went to sixth form and started applying for universities, I literally freaked out because I was like, I didn't see anyone like me. So I'm just going to go and do business, which is what the stats show you. Mm -hmm. so, you know, I, I'm so excited for what technology can do for us. <clears throat> I'm so excited that this means everyone will have information. Uh, everyone will have opportunities. It will definitely cost of living, cost of commuting, cost of um, cost even like mental pressure and, and, and mental stress that you get with all of that. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we've already seen Cambridge take all of their lectures online. So I'm just, uh, kind of what I want to end, uh, end in saying is, you know, I really hope that during this time, we as individuals and as collective take responsibility of what kind of impact we can make as simple as sharing information or be that as simple as uh, reaching out saying how can I lend and how can I hand and that schools and education system and, and academia really follows technology so that <coughs> they can enable a large group of, of, of diverse characters into their premise, they can educate them. And I definitely think, um, you know, on the basis of that, the newer generation that's coming into these industries will, will be fundamental because they will significantly change the ways of working, the ways we think, and even the, the products that come out of it in the end. Fantastic, thank you so much, Sonia. Um, I actually wanted to touch on your accessibility point. So um, obviously within our team in Jubix, um, you know, we had the idea of the, you know, the future notion of actually having LCD screens. So obviously when you go to Costco, when you go to Costa Coffee, when you go to McDonald's, they have like these interactive screens now that you can actually make your order and it's supposed to make things much more faster, right? Um, I even realized that even now, the Uber guy is more important than the actual customer in McDonald's. So <laughs> it shows you how technology has really advanced the way you know, things are accessed. Um, so for me, I feel that if there was LCD screens that people could actually interact with these LCD screens on the go, then you would have that whole accel um, accessibility feature as well as you'd be able to you know, give people the chance if they don't have internet access or they don't have laptop facilities within the home, they would be able to still access the same solution that everybody else has been able to access. So that's kind of how we, you know, see the future. <laughs> that people just be like typing on their, their screens and connecting with different various people, matching with potential investors, matching with potential experts that have expertise to scale their business or you know, uh, projects. Um, so that's, you know, something that we see in the long term anyway. <laughs> yeah, I definitely agree with you. I think the, the, the fact is that this time is never going to come again, but we needed this. We keep talking about the fourth industrial revolution. We keep talking about how technology is changing our lives or the use of technology. And we've come through COVID and actually, you know, majority of the country, if I use UK as an example, have no clue what to do because it was all talk and no one actually thought about what would we have to do if this time came. Uh, I've worked with many businesses and, you know, some businesses don't even have company laptops to take home. Other businesses have never worked from home. So, some businesses, I, we have, I have kind of like, you know, I, I coach five to 10 clients and kind of run like seven workshops every week on topics like how to manage different conversations online how to create remote working teams, how to build a sense of community, because the, the lack of education is there. Um, but what this time is great for is that innovative and new style of practices that we didn't have before, that we can really share into the future and say, this is what the future looks like. And people, people can't really be like, mm, no, we're not sure. Because you're like, because we, we, we we this is a time for us to recreate the future now. You know, if we go back to how we were working, we'd be silly. Because those long hours, that commuting, that mental pressure, no one should have done it in the first place. So this is like a clean slate or a new canvas to be like, actually, I've worked with for three months. I don't really need to come back because I've done a really good job here. Or actually, I know I can do this job remotely. And I, think it, I, I personally think it puts a lot more power and a lot more um, strength in the hands of normal people like employees, colleagues, customers, who, who didn't necessarily have that voice before. I know that when I asked to work from home for my last companies, my first company, my manager, so I, I come from an Asian background, like as you can tell, my mother was sick and I had to take my brother to school. This was only four years ago. My manager said, you have to take a day off to take your brother to school. You can't work from home because we need you in the office. 
And I was like, taking him to school in broken back is not going to cause any issues. And they were like, well, no, you're not the parent. So you can't take work from home for that. Only parents can do it. Right. Mm -hmm. So that affected me because care of responsibilities are important. Of and course. Last year, when I, I last year, my old company, I used to commute two hours a day to work and I had no clients. I just had to sit next to my manager in the office because that's presenteeism. Uh, and when I told them about my mental health, it didn't matter to them because presenteeism is more important and uh, they didn't have working from home at that point. So my point mm -hmm. being that now these people that feel all these ways, we have a lot more power to leverage and hopefully it's going to help us as normal human beings in the workplace, in the system to change and to craft this new uh, kind of normal, as we call it, the way we want to work, the way we want to live, and then really help uh, everyone else to embrace that. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sonia. Um, I just wanted to touch on the inclusion point. So obviously the fact that we have four women panelists here today, whoop, whoop. <laughs> um, I think that um, obviously shows that, you know, we are getting out of the old age and into the new age. Um, I don't want to exclude men either. I just think that there is, you know, there, there's, there's, there's enough room for everyone. Um, and I think that, you know, if anything, we would work better together than, you know, apart. So um, I would like to uh, go into our next uh, five minute overview from Chris. Uh, Chris, are you there? If you would like to uh, start your overview. Hey, Susan. So, yeah, um, thanks for inviting me to this conference. Just wanted to respond a little bit to the previous uh, conversation about uh, working from home before I then go into the rest of the overview. So I think the working from home um, development is very interesting. And like the other panelists, I definitely agree that um, there's a lot of opportunity because with the advent of working from home and remote working, at least among quite a lot of jobs and occupations, you get um, the opportunity to be able to work from wherever you are. And so that opens up the ability to participate in um, companies and jobs across geographies and allows you to, um, we haven't really spoken that much about disability and accessibility in this panel, but it allows people who might be mobility impaired to participate as well in, um, in jobs and occupations where they may have had difficulty if they needed to, um, they had difficulty maybe um, finding transportation to the office, for example. So I think there is a lot of possibility here. Um, what I have noticed, I think this will feed into the overview, is that when people talk about the future of work and remote working and working from home, um, there seems to be a reliance on, I would say, survey data and more kind of speculation and thought leadership and um, abstraction rather than necessarily a deep understanding of the remote worker experience. And so as an anthropologist, I take more of a people-centered approach to these problems. And what I think is that um, if we're going to talk about what skills perhaps are needed for remote working and what spaces are needed and what tools are needed, a good place to start would be an ethnographic approach that really highlights the experiences of people who are currently remote working so that we know um, what they need in their particular contextual circumstance as a company might be a different context than another company and people are sort of now situated within the home and private environment when they weren't otherwise. So we get an understanding of that as well as um, what, because the types of practices that they're currently undertaking would be if we understand what's happening there and sort of workarounds, if you're thinking about a user experience research perspective, the kind of workarounds that people are developing, then we might understand what will be needed in the future. So I would really advocate for those who are just watching this discussion as well, as well as maybe those who are participating in it, to think more, to also engage in kind of deeper use, deeper kind of research with those who are currently working so that we know what sort of the facts are on the ground. Um, now back to the overview, I definitely agree with the premise of this as uh, STEM education has definitely historically been concentrated among um, the middle and upper classes. It's also been uh, also those who engage with STEM tend to be uh, men, not women, as we've discussed also that um, ethnic uh, and racial backgrounds tend to be mostly white. And um, this 
tends to link very much with class and tends to link very much with wealth, with magnet schools, at least in the US context, often being located within wealthier areas. And since the, um, and with access to better education, those more privileged demographics find it easier to obtain the skills necessary to work in tech, to get the quantitative skills needed for programming, for example, to even start something like Python. Um, and the fact that the education just sort of keeps going in that direction means that's kind of like a past dependent loop. And so what we really need to do is need to figure out a way to, a way to break all of those paths in the first place, a way to sort of institute a, a rupture that allows for more uh, opportunity to develop. And as I've, um, as some other people on this panel, I also come from a tech background. And um, the way that uh, the way that I see it is that the comp because of the way that STEM um, literacy has developed, the composition of the tech sector has historically been male, has historically been white, has historically been wealthy, and fairly urban at that, leading to the uh, the so-called tech bro stereotype of the um, the masculinist wealthy guy with like the kind of ridiculous looking baseball cap. Um, and that sort of thing is uh, there is a real need to challenge it. There's a real need to uh, bring more voices into the fold. And not only that, there's a real need to, to address the types of toxic environments that develop within companies. So it isn't really only opportunity to get into jobs, but also to break the cultures that are forming within tech companies, for example, in the first place. So, um, I think that with investment and with uh, the education, the opportunities and the sort of programs and innovative things I'm hearing about, and I think the things that are gonna be talked about in this, uh, in this panel, it's um, stakes really high. I think that those programs and projects that are developed should again, um, definitely be targeted and should be developed with more of a perspective on those who are entering, those who, have the opportunity to enter and those who are also excluded. Um, to illustrate the stakes, I mean, when you don't look at the stock market and how the quote defensive stocks have been associated with tech rather than um, company, rather than other types of things like utilities and others. So um, STEM is really important for the future, but the pace of investment the pace, and the pace of change tends to be pretty slow. So um, with uh, STEM investments being concentrated in sort of privileged racial class um, with uh, gender demographics and within that also those who have the physical ability to participate, I think the questions are then around uh, how we make those investments more equitable and uh, resolving the challenges. So I definitely look forward to uh, hearing about that from the rest of this panel. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Chris, for that overview. Um, now we're going to go into our second question. Um, the second question is, investments in STEM activities can take years to see a return. What may be the solution to make these investments more equitable? So I'll just repeat that once again. Investments in STEM activities can take years to see a return. What may be the solution to make these investments more equitable? And I'd like to first refer that to Louisa, and uh, so that we can get you back into the fold, um, and uh, see what you have to say on the matter. Yeah, sure. So, um, thinking about that question, I two things came to mind. One of them is how do you um, how do you make that investment return come quicker? Um, but it, it, it's quite difficult with. Um, with the current education system, I find that it's a twofold thing because you have the education system, which is outdated. It's based on um, the industrial revolution, the first one. <laughs> and um, and when, when you look at how school works, how we are supposed to be there at certain times, when the bell rings, you go for lunch or you go and change classes and your deadlines, it's all very similar to that industrial um, to prepare someone for for factory life and obviously that has changed um, 
rapidly. Um, it's changed a while ago and this debate has been ongoing for a while. Um, I remember debating this when I was in school, you know, what are the things that we are going to be doing when, when we eventually leave school? And um, I think there is, uh, the private sector has done a very good job in um, making the case for STEM um, and uh, trying to attract more talent. And they've been doing this in various ways. Like if you look at how the, these jobs are set up today, they are the most flexible jobs. They are very well paid. Um, and, and then you have all, all this effort in attracting the young as well. So you get all these perks and all these different things that, um, all these benefits that are added with um, with your job, and um, and that helps in attracting people. Then you have we have what Mohanad was saying on all these um, online education providers. You have Udacity, you have Udemy, you have Treehouse, you have all these all these um, uh, different different solutions to get people back and try and stabilize that that gap but it, it's it's a very difficult thing to be done i think that sort of approach later uh, when the person's already grown up when you've already had a career you you know it's it's a bit late but it's a solution it's something they can they can approach and then i think the the long term the necessity really is becoming a necessity now is um, really upgrading our education system and being realistic about what children are going to be facing when they leave school and making sure that they have the skills. Um, I, I, one very fam uh, famous educator, Sir Ken Robinson, he said, creativity is as important as literacy these days because we are preparing for an unpredictable world we have the information we need um we need the skills to do something with that information so um in, in school we don't necessarily get taught these skills yet you get told what to do and then when you leave school you are expected to be confident to know what you're doing to have a schedule and and the the gap and the yeah the difficulty just widens so then obviously what chris was saying with the demographics the different um opportunities uh the social um children that you know besides the fact that we have all this technology there are so many people that still can't access it so it does take a um i believe it takes a co collective effort it's it's going to be uh, private sector, it's going to require government, it's going to require school systems, families, um, you know, parents participating in it because um, it's something that I believe we, um, we are seeing now um, the effects of something that we should, we should have been preparing for and, and changing or reforming from a long time ago. Um, so I believe the investments that are being made right now, uh, they need to continue for adults to also have, you know, their, uh, a chance to change careers or to learn something more meaningful um, for the world that they live in now. Um, but I believe the actual solution would be, is, is much more difficult and, and much more time consuming, which is, a reform in in the current education system. Fantastic, thank you, Lisa. Before I pass it over to uh, Helen to uh, give a response, I just wanted to touch on uh, some of your points that you made. So, um, I actually received information yesterday that obviously uh, GovTech is going to be actually the technology that surpasses every other, um, you know, fintech, insurtech. It's actually uh, GovTech is going to be uh, one of the ones that surpass these other sectors due to the fact that actually governments need technical solutions going forward. So they're looking, you know, to the people <laughs> to be able to come up with these solutions um, because obviously government, obviously, you know, probably have a broader sense in terms of, you know, uh, providing the policies and, you know, frameworks or whatever it may be. 
And when it comes to actual technical solutions, they're looking to the people to be able to bring these solutions forward and, and propose them. So I think definitely that would, you know, obviously ensure that you know, the education system is reformed. That will also ensure that, you know, in terms of voting, in terms of, um, you know, actually uh, participating in certain uh, policies and uh, frameworks and actually, you know, having a say, uh, will actually become more and more um, inevitable going forward. Um, so I just want um, Helen to also uh, touch on our question. Helen, uh, would you like to uh, just have your brief uh, say on the question? Absolutely, yes. I've got quite a few um, that I really enjoyed from the previous speakers. I and mean, I think the key point in terms of your question about how do we speed things up is we really do need to measure what works. So echoing what Chris said, you know, we need to look if we're doing early age interventions at the early stage in primary school, which is the time we know is very formative for children's ideas and for just their basic skills in maths and English, all the foundational skills that allow them to, to go forward and be more confident to take on a wider curriculum later in life, which might include, you know, going more in depth into the STEM. We need to really measure what works. So um, uh, somebody I know works on something called physical literacy. And when she told me she was doing that, I didn't really know what physical literacy was. You know, I didn't really understand what it meant. So I said, you know, well, what is physical literacy? And she was going in and working with some of the most, um, Sort of challenged children in, in schools who you know they either had learning difficulties or they were from backgrounds where they didn't have a lot of exercise and support from parents at home for various different reasons but just giving them physical skills and confidence in their physical movement made a measurable difference to their outcomes in english and maths you know so things like that which are very very targeted can make a massive difference but a lot of people don't even know what physical literacy is and the assumption is that especially Actually, we've talked a lot about women, but especially boys, for example, that struggle in school. A lot of them don't learn well just sitting at a desk. You know, the best thing you could do for them would be to let them out of the classroom for 10 minutes to do two loops of the, of the playground and come back just to stretch their legs and sit down again because they can concentrate better. So we really need to measure, you know, how these different approaches are working. And I think that's probably going to make the biggest difference. And I, I'm very interested in the work of Caroline Criado Perez, who's written a lot about the gender data gap and, and what we don't measure. Um, and I think, you know, in this COVID crisis, we know that um, certain communities are being, you know, heavily affected in different ways. So um, it may be great that women can work more from home because it's more flexible, but they're also, we know, taking on probably the lion's share of the childcare while their children are not in school. They're taking on more of the domestic cleaning responsibilities. So actually juggling that with working from home is a lot harder. Um, on the other hand, you know, men and, and BAME communities are, are medically potentially more likely to be badly affected by the disease itself and to, to be more severely ill or even to pass away. So, you know, we need to be capturing all of this data and things like contact tracing, although they're very controversial, do give us a potential opportunity to maybe gather some important data sets that we can use to actually research this and see how different parts of society are being affected. So. My sort of vision is, is very much in line with Louise's, which is that we use this as an opportunity to adapt the education system. And we know that a lot of what we do in schools isn't necessarily that useful, actually, um, when it comes to future of work and, and teaching people how to be more entrepreneurial and how to be you know, more scientific in their thinking. So let's use it as a chance to you know, really adapt that. And maybe, you know, I, I spend my time teaching about blockchain and one of the concepts in blockchain is you can create sort of a lifelong kind of educational CV for somebody, which I know is something you're interested in. So, you know, we measure people's skills, not just on what GCSEs or A-levels or formal qualifications they've got, but what other talents they have and what skills they have. And we can document that. And people can even get rewarded um, through micropayments, through cryptocurrencies for the contributions they make to scientific projects or to innovation projects or technology projects or an, even creative projects. I mean, I saw a great project for, for Eid that, that was a few days ago, you know, people were celebrating Eid and they can't go out and celebrate with their friends. So somebody created this project called COVID and it was a lot of creative bits of graphic design that you could just download and credit the creators and send to your mm -hmm. friends. And, you know, that's such a cool project and people could be rewarded for that in cryptocurrency and get paid for their creative work. So they've made all these beautiful bits of art just to celebrate something and help people in the Muslim community enjoy their celebration, even though they can't meet with their family. So, there's so many ways that we could we could change this and, and speed things up. 
This is where we come to our interactive session. I don't know if uh, any of our attendees would like to point any questions at our panelists. So if you have a question, you would send it via the chat area. If not, we can have our last comments from our panelists. So while we're having our last comments, if any questions come through, then I'll just uh, obviously um, point it at the right uh, panelist member. Um, so first, if I, we could get um, your last comments, Mahanid, just obviously from what you've heard. So, yeah, I think, yeah, um, STEM, STEM jobs are just going to skyrocket even more. Um, we're, 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 we're just still at the very early stages of it. And everything I'm seeing in what I'm working in, in cybersecurity, in insurtech, in just it just shows that the curve is going to go like that. It's uh, it's here to stay, and uh, it's it's key that people really um, take these skills up because every single uh, industry is going to be affected by it. By it, absolutely every single industry, um, everything from uh, kind of fashion, media, gaming, food, banking, whatever. It's and it's it's vital we get uh, the skills um, um, necessary to, uh, to to be able to fill these positions because it, it's all going to be more sci-fi than than what we're used to. Um, in terms of the workplace, um, I think talk about the death of the office probably is still a little bit premature. I think um, uh, the, I mean, the way we've all, uh, we already embraced that co concept in terms of a paperless office, a digital office, but we used to have one or two core days a week and three days or four days a week, everybody worked from home. I think a communal space is still necessary. People still want to be able to uh, get together with their colleagues and throw ideas and uh, uh, just for their own uh, kind of sanity and mental health to go and um, meet up with other colleagues, but but yeah, I, I, but but that is generally the trend where things are going. So uh, yeah, it's, it's vital we get the skills necessary and encourage people to retrain. I know everyone's embracing this new tech world. I know some people uh, find this whole thing really scary because they they just avoid tech whenever. But there's just no running away from it at the moment, unfortunately. Thank you so much, Mahanid. Um, Sonia, if you'd like to just have your last uh, words. Yeah, I'm extremely, especially after this conversation, I'm so excited about the future of technology and the future of STEM. And, and it's great to see, like we made a point before, the different perspectives and the varied um, characters that are just on this call alone who, who have such a vision for the future. And I definitely think it's that vision that's going to enable us to work together, to build communities, to really come together with key nuggets, um, complement each other and, and increase not only the jobs that are in STEM, but the opportunity that's in STEM and the, the ideas that we can come, like the advancements and the innovation. I think from, from now to the next 15 years, we're going to see innovation back in the market because, because everyone from everywhere can really put their two cents in to say this works this doesn't work this fits our mold this doesn't fit our mold how do we break the boxes um and what i would ask everyone to do and what kind of the challenge would be is you know think about how you can how we can give back during this time not just the time of covid but generally what are we doing in our day-to-day -day lives where we are giving back where we're showcasing that we are role models in stem or or we are leading uh, thought leadership in tech, or, you know, we come from kind of non-typical tech backgrounds and, and we've made it so other people can too. Uh, and, and that's kind of what I, what I want to leave it with. But, you know, the, the sense of community that this has brought and the, the, the passion that we all have to really ignite STEM and STEM futures and inclusive um, STEM practices in the future is, is, you know, exactly what I personally live for day in and, and day out. Thank you so much, Sonia. We've actually, you know, obviously loved having you as one of our panelists as well. Um, Louisa, would your last thoughts? Uh, yeah, same, similar to Sonia. Very excited to see everyone, um, everyone talking about it. Uh, it's um, the future is is exciting. It's completely unpredictable, very uncertain. But I think the challenges are there. The skills are there. We all have the, the tools, you know, to solve these problems. They, it, it, it's, it requires that collective effort and that coming together to, to find a solution. And um, I, I think, yeah, it, it, it's going to be, um, it's exciting, it's challenging. And yeah, I can't wait, um, can't wait to see what happens also post, um, 
post-COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Louisa. Uh, Chris, your last remarks? Hi, Susan. So I mean, I, I like the other. It's very heartening to see such an emphasis on creativity, but also um, facts and how we can actually move things forward. I think um, just to piggyback on what Louisa was saying, um, um, creativity, when it comes to STEM and sort of how products will be designed in the future and types of um, things that will be designed. The, I think it's very important that while we continue to uh, improve STEM education, we also, along with that, we also continue to further um, critical thinking and sort of critical insight and the um, sort of classes and courses that further that, such as art or such as humanities, just because. Um, among user experience researchers, there is sometimes a critique that a product might be kind of like an engineering solution to a social problem. <laughs> um, and so with that, um, it can be, it's always good to have sort of insights that aren't just coming from a traditional STEM perspective of doing, uh, building something here to solve something like that would actually be um, so she might be something else. So I think just to encourage maybe pluralism and uh, in the courses and in the um, education that's offered as well. But I mean, thanks everyone so much for uh, participation and for inviting me along. I appreciate it. I look forward to continuing conversations. Thank you, Chris. So we actually have a question pointed uh, from one of our attendees, Vivian. Um, she asks, is, how do you think remote working will affect UX research methods? Great. Um, <laughs> so what you're, sorry, I, I, um, as I was speaking, I didn't see the chat, but <laughs> thanks. Yeah, so yeah. I think the, um, a big thing you're seeing right now is um, remote methods. Like um, if we're speaking from a qualitative perspective, um, usability tests like traditionally were often done, you know, like, in labs and for those who aren't really from the US background, a usability test is basically where you observe how someone is using an app or a piece of technology and you ask them to complete certain tasks and you evaluate how they're doing the tasks and you uh, learn from them the issues that they're facing. Um, those used to be done in person traditionally, they used to be done in labs and uh, they were often done in kind of a sort of a weird way where you might be completing the task and then there might be a mirror and then there might be a panel of product people watching how you were doing, um, which is kind of weird when you think about it in that way. Um, the way that you're starting to see this change is that you already were seeing remote usability platforms like Zoom, like user Zoom, and people were using Zoom before um, the crisis as well to do usability tests with people um, across geographies. So those were often, uh, you could send a prototype and have them click through a prototype, click through a website, and do it, um, have them screen share. So you're already seeing that. Um, I'm gonna say there is much more at that right now. So the um, remote usability platforms like user Zoom and user testing, for example, those are only becoming more important. And I was, the other day I was looking at some usability platforms I had heard of, but it turns out they're gaining, pro they're gaining prominence. Um, other than that, you're seeing uh, more uses mm -hmm. in um, remote interviewing, remote qualitative interviewing, and that's just holding an interview through, um, through Zoom. And you're starting also, I would say, is that if we're remote working for the conceivable future, you probably will see a form of digital ethnography, and that's um, a way of, of observing how people interact online, how the online context is a context for like using the um, applications. So you're going to see more of that. You're going to probably see fewer home visits because there are certain ethical considerations around being able to do a home visit um, because you don't want to bring give anyone like um, COVID nineteen or anything. Um, so it is, I mean, to answer your question, it is definitely accelerating research methods. Um, we'll see how it, it happens in the future because UX research is constantly changing. Um, I look forward to watching how it goes.
Thank you, Chris. Um, we have another last question. I don't know if I'm, if I, hopefully I can say it correctly. Um, if everyone is offered the same educational platforms leading to becoming experts in their area, personality, personalities might lose out. Does anybody want to? Does that, does that mean that if everyone has the same and equal opportunity, then we won't have the diversity of thought or we won't have the diversity of leadership? Is that what that conversation relates to? Um, cause yes, of course there is that aspect, but equally, you know, until a certain age, we all have equal opportunities anyway, and everyone takes the path that they think they are most suited in or that they enjoy the most. So I don't necessarily think that personalities will, will, um, miss out. If anything, I think the opposite, if they're given the accessible education and equal education opportunities, possibly it means that... <coughs> We will have a, uh, a number of different personalities and characters who can then get involved and bring their thinking and their, their diversity of thought. Um, you know, especially because, for example, when you're at school, we bring it back down to the grassroots level. You're set, they, they said you can either have art or maths. You can't do both, right? Technology is doing both. Technology is being creative and logical at the same time, and that's how I define it. So hopefully it means that we will have a different viewpoint um, and, and large amounts of personalities and, and to those who are worried about losing out on yeah because some people are worried about losing out on jobs and opportunities and, and their growth and progression for every jobs uh, you know for all the jobs that kind of our are, are, are kind of put in a graveyard you know new jobs are, are born so mm -hmm. they say that by 2023 there'll be 52 million new jobs in the world that didn't exist 10 years ago right a million is a massive number so we shouldn't be afraid of evolution and we shouldn't be afraid of of uh, kind of consistent movement what we should then just do as individuals is make sure that we know our strengths and our successes and see how we can really help mm -hmm. benefit our, uh, ourselves going forward i just want to touch on that so i actually think that as individuals we all have many personalities within ourselves so obviously in the terms of decentralized I think that we will be decentralized within ourselves so we won't have to feel that we are you know pigeonholed into one specific sector or pigeonholed into one specific subject we can be diversified cross-functional in every way so I think that you know the future is where you would actually see remote working as in you can go from different organizations different projects working on different different um startups on a daily basis so you know i could be working in technology today marketing tomorrow it could be for one organization or multiple organizations and i think that's where the future is in terms of diversification and uh, creativity i just want to hear our last closing remarks from helen um, and then we can wrap up for today helen Thank you. I love that point you made about how, you know, we have these multiple different qualities within ourselves, because I think a lot of people that I meet that I feel I'm just trying to say that our, our approach is not going to be uniform to learning and to, to working online. And I think actually more diversity in the workplace and in schools and in other um, organisations will help us to adapt to that because we all need to understand how the other person works. You know, are they an introvert or an extrovert? Exactly. Or a mixture of the two. Are they a verbal learner or a visual learner? So we need to be very um, innovative, very creative, very wide ranging in how we understand how the interactions that we're having online affect the other person. And even being on Zoom, you know, some people just hate being on Zoom. They hate staring at their own face all day. You know, they find it very fatiguing. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't particularly enjoy it, even though I'm, I consider myself a people person, but I like face-to-face -face interactions in the physical world. I find it less enjoyable having those interactions on the online world. So that's something I've learned about myself just in the last few weeks doing this. And I've been working at home for a very long time. Thank you so much, Helen. I would like to first uh, thank you to all my panelists here today for obviously attending the session and actually taking time out of your uh, work life um, lifestyle. And also, obviously, thank you to our attendees. Um, and yeah, have a great afternoon. And uh, we look forward to uh, obviously having some more episodes. So uh, take care and uh, good luck with all your projects. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Cheers, thanks. Bye. Bye.